guys, so it is now going on 7 o'clock. Yeah, 7 o'clock on Friday, September 17th, and I'm finally getting started with Song of Susanna by Stephen King. I have been in such a weird reading mood recently that I thought I was going to get to this way earlier, like sometime last week or earlier this week, I thought, but I'm a little behind. For those of you that are not aware, I have been doing a Stephen King reading series. I will leave the playlist for that in the description, as well as a specific playlist for the Dark Tower series, because this is a very expansive series, and I felt it, that it was a good idea to have a separate playlist because of the fact that, like, there's eight books in this particular series, and some some people only really want to know my thoughts on The Dark Tower, which if you're not familiar, The Dark Tower is a series that Stephen King had created starting back in the late 1980s, maybe mid-1980s, that essentially spanned over the course of several years and is one of his most popular work because of the fact that the world that is involved in The Dark Tower is a multiverse and then therefore expands to several standalones and other series that Stephen King had written before The Dark Tower was created and many books that were created after it was first brought up and basically created. The Song of Susanna is the sixth book in the series. There are technically eight books with the first four being basically canon and then the last three. And then after the series was wrapped up, there was another book that was basically a prequel story that was placed in the timeline between books four and five. So there are eight books. I have a whole video dedicated to that prequel story that came at the midway point of my reading series. The Song of Susanna, like I said, being book six, is not the smallest of the books that there are, but it is one of the smaller ones. The biggest book being about almost 900, maybe just over 900 pages. The smallest being about 200 153, not including the prequel book that was created that was the midway point in my reading series. Now, The Song of Susanna is basically piggybacking right off the tail end of Wolves of the Kala, which was book five, and I'm going to read the description for you guys that is on the back of the book, or the synopsis, and basically let you know what we are to expect within this. The demon mother, Mia, has usurped the body of Susanna Dean and used the power of Black 13 to transport to New York City in the summer of 1999 in order to give birth to her chap or her baby. While Jake Chambers, Oi, and Father Callahan set out to find Susanna Mia, Eddie and Roland tumble into western Maine in the summer of 1977, a world that should be idyllic but isn't. For one thing, it is real and the bullets are flying. For another, it is inhabited by the author of a novel called Salem's Lot, a writer who turns out to be as shocked by them as they are by him. The penultimate novel in the Dark Tower series, Song of Susanna, is at once a book of revelation, a fascinating key to the unfolding mystery of the Dark Tower, and a fast-paced story of double-barreled suspense that will leave readers gasping for the saga's final volume. So, if you are unfamiliar with whatever the hell that was, basically, I would suggest going back and re-watching some of the reading vlog reviews I've done of this series, because ultimately, if you're watching this video in the middle of this series and have no idea what I'm talking about, then you are going to need to go either read those or, or watch those, because there's a lot that basically is going to be going on. Also, this video will be spoiler-filled, because I will be basically going in-depth, chapter by chapter, of what the story tells. So there's a lot, like I said, to do with other stories. The multiverse of the Dark Tower expands to various other stories that Stephen King had written before the Dark Tower was created and several books that were created after the story. Now, in particular, this one deals with Salem's Lot, which was the second book that Stephen King had published. And I have a review of that that you can go check out. It was the second book I did in the beginning of my reading series of Stephen King. And I remember giving that book four out of five stars. Now, we learned a lot about Salem's Lot in terms of the fact that one of the characters, Father Callahan, was a huge, huge part in Wolves of the Kala. And we learned at the end of Wolves of the Kala that Salem's Lot was actually written into to a book and essentially had taken the thoughts and things that Father Callahan had said about things that happened in Salem's Lot, which was the exact story of Salem's Lot, and essentially there was a basically real world inversion of the story of Salem's Lot. Stephen King's name was in the story, you know, it, it basically was indicating to us that there is a huge tie to our reality, our current reality, because by the time that that book had been released, Salem's Lot had been out for probably almost 30 years by that point, and it was basically just a call out to say, hey, this book is actually involved in the Dark Tower, you know, specifically, like, this character that's here 
obviously this is a big tie and here's more proof of that. That was kind of the idea of calling it out by the end of the book. So we've got two stories going on here, obviously. So we're going to be jumping through, my guess is, between the stories of going after Susanna Mia, who basically in the Wolves of the Kala, you learn that Susanna has kind of had this demon-like child growing inside of her and a personality that has kind of accompanied it that has just taken over by the end of Wolves of the Kala. And yeah, and then we're going to see Essentially, my guess is Eddie and Roland going to go find Calvin Tower, who we also meet in Wolves of the Kala, and partially meet in the Wastelands with Jake's original story. And my guess is that they're going to go find him and try to protect him because in Wolves of the Kala, there was a whole story dealing with that. And it was basically a way of them trying to find the tower and protect it because it was in danger. There's so much to go into that, honestly, if you're watching this and this is the first video of mine you're seeing and you haven't watched any of the other ones in this series in particular you're going to be very lost. So I would highly recommend going and watching the other ones because I'm going to basically be talking about a lot of shit that for most people you're not going to really know unless you've read the books yourself or you've watched my other videos. This book clocks in at about 413 pages. So what I usually do is about every 100 pages come in and tell you what happens if you're not familiar with how I do this whole setup. I, like I said, go about every 100 pages or so and tell you what happened in those 100 pages and my thoughts on it. Now, in this case, because we landed on 413, which is just over 400 pages, I'll basically go and check in at page 100, 200, 300 and then when we get to the end of the book because more than likely we're going to get to page 400 and there's going to be only those last 13 pages and it doesn't really seem to make much sense to me to cut, check in at page 400 and then read the last 13 pages and then come back with pretty much no new thoughts. Hey guys so it is now going on 5 45 basically on Sunday. Please don't mind the mountain of clothes and bags behind me. My husband is going to be folding the laundry since I did the laundry, so I'm just leaving it there for him for later when he gets home from work. So anyway, let's talk about the first 100 pages of Song of Susanna. So in reality, the amount of things that happened wasn't exactly a lot. It was just large scenes, again, like what happened in Wolves of the Kala, where the scenes in particular were fairly long by themselves. But let's go over what happened nonetheless. So we basically start off the book, which is broken up instead of into chapters, into what are called stanzas, because for the end of each chapter, there is basically a stanza of a song that is brought about, or at least it's like a poem of some kind, because for those of you that are familiar with how poetry works, and basically how songwriting works, each paragraph of lines, essentially, or group of lines that are put together are called stanzas, and those are broken up by usually about a space width of, you know, whatever may be. So this is kind of how the story's broken up, is that at the end of each chapter, you have a group of lines, basically in a call and response manner, that is brought up because it somehow is indicative of the chapter itself, and it's supposed to be put together to create a song or poem of some kind. So we start off the first stanza, which is called Beanquake, where basically we kind of pick up off after the events of Wolves of the Kala, where Roland, Jake, Oi, Eddie, and a couple other people that are involved in Kala Sturgis are basically trying to decide what is to happen. And you find out that they decide that they're basically going to split up. They have Father Callahan, like it talks about in the synopsis, who is going to help Jake and Oi go to find Susanna, and then Eddie and Roland are going to be basically going after Calvin Tower. So that's pretty much the idea of what happens in that first chapter. Then we get into stanza two, which is called The Persistence of Magic. This is basically where the journey begins in terms of everybody kind of going their separate ways. They basically head to the cave where the Black 13 orb was and basically is the doorway to New York and they get Eddie to open up the cave so that they can access New York City and go hopefully find Mia, Susanna, whatever we exactly want to call her. It's not really 100% certain what we're going to be able to call her because they actually call her Susanna Mia because kind of what 
is she is at this point. Then we move into the third chapter, the third stanza, which is called Trudy and Mia. And here we start actually seeing this character named Trudy Damascus, who essentially comes across the woman, Susanna, Mia, whatever you want to call her, basically, and has a very strange interaction because basically Mia is able to get these people in the real world, in our world, basically, to bend to her will in a sense and in a sense do this compulsion work where she's able to pretty much like put them under a bit of a spell for a time and get them to do what she wants. And this woman Trudy runs into them and there's an altercation and afterward Trudy basically is dumbfounded. She's very lost. She doesn't understand what exactly happened but she knows that something happened and she's not right ever since. Like she really has no clue what's going on. Then we go into the fourth chapter for the fourth stanza which is called Susanna's Dogen and here we start to actually see the, like from Susanna's perspective and Mia's perspective. You learn in this chapter that Susanna is aware and is able to control her own body but Mia is very scared and shy of a lot of things and that's typically when Susanna will be able to take over but Susanna is working with Mia to basically hold off the birth of this chap until they can find a suitable place to do this and in order to find the suitable place they have to kind of adhere to the way that things work in this world which means that things require money they can't just steal things they have to acquire money somehow and through Mia's compulsion techniques, they're able to basically get a lot of stuff set up for this. They're able to basically compel people to give them money or give them resources in order to get on their way. Then we go into chapter five, the fifth stanza, which is called The Turtle. And here we start to see that part of the way that Mia is able to compel people is through this turtle object that she has. It's, you know, very much something that people become desire desirable of. They want this thing very badly and they will do what they need to to ob obtain it. And many times you will see over the course of this journey that people are like, can I hold the turtle? Can I have the turtle? And Mia's like, no, you can't. This is mine. And the people get kind of upset about it. So they have to kind of use this as a tool to work with the compulsion and then essentially protect it because it is a very powerful weapon of sorts. Mia talks about how there's like some kind of thing that they're supposed to do in order to bring this chap there and there's not really a clue as to what exactly that is. There is a lot of stuff about this that is interesting because for one Susanna's never seen this world. This is basically 1999 if you will. So a lot of things have changed from what Susanna already knows of the world because she's from 1964. So for instance there is a lot of fashion changes that Susanna picks out. How women are wearing you know belly shirts and short shorts and all these things and it's stuff that she would never have thought about because of the fact that she grew up in a very very different time and as a black woman especially. So they end up getting a room in this Swedish hotel and Mia essentially puts stuff in the safe in the hotel room to protect it and it basically involves the Oriza weapon that Susanna had used in Caliber and Sturgis to take down the wolves and various other things that Mia and Susanna have picked up along the way. So they decide that it's now at this point Mia and Susanna are basically going to palaver. They're going to learn about what exactly it is that Mia is doing. Mia is going to pretty much tell Susanna what the plan is, what's going on, that kind of a thing. And in order to do that, they kind of have to go through this trance-like state in order to create, they have to almost go into a toe dash, which was explained a lot in The Wolves of the Kala. We learned a lot about what the toe dash is. And in order for these two to talk more effectively, which they've apparently done before, they've been able to kind of talk about this through Susanna's dreaming and her dream states essentially, they have to basically go into this toe dash to tell the story of what's exactly happening. And that's pretty much all we learn. And like I said, we are in chapter six right now, which is called The Castle Allure. Again, not a lot really that's happened. That's kind of the basic idea of what's happening. I am listening to the audiobook in addition to physically reading this. I did that for the first hundred pages where I was mostly listening to the audiobook but tracking my progress in the book because I feel like that it makes it a lot easier for me to understand what's going on and the audiobooks are always enjoyable for me. I have never found a Stephen King book that was created into an audiobook that I didn't like. And I think that that's because I've just grown to really like Stephen King's writing and I just really think that the audiobooks that are created from his books 
are well produced and they just do a lot for me in terms of bringing the story to life. Now, I do think that a lot of times it's easier for me to read, to listen and to read at the same time because it does make the story a lot clearer. I'm able to see things a little bit better. And this is because, especially with like The Dark Tower, it's a very vast world and being able to pick up on some things is a little harder than others. The same thing happened to me when I was going through the Song of Ice and Fire books by George R. R. Martin, where reading the physical books and listening to the audiobooks made the attempt at grasping the world a lot easier because I was actually more so able to really picture scenes a little bit better with the voice acting, things of that nature. So that's kind of what I, why I've been really relying on the audiobooks more so than the physical. But when reading, I tend to like listening and reading at the same time because it makes it a lot more enjoyable and I can just grasp the scenes a little bit easier. I, I really don't know exactly how this is all going to pan out. I, I think that at the very least we're going to spend at least another chapter with Susanna and Mia to learn Mia's side of the story and then my hope is that soon within the next couple of chapters we'll either go back to Jake, Father Callahan, and Oi or we will go to Eddie and Roland. Hi guys, so it is currently Tuesday. It is going on four o'clock in the evening and I've just finished work. I apologize if it's a little darker than normal. It's been raining off and on outside and it's pretty gloomy. Doesn't look like it's really gonna stop. But I am here to bring you more information about what happens in Song of Susanna. So I have reached page 201 and I'm actually kind of invested in this more so than I thought I was. There was a huge reveal brought up very early in the like last hundred pages that I'm kind of shocked by, but I'm also really interested because it essentially is like something that could bring about the downfall of Roland Deschain. So let me get into what exactly happens. So Right before we ended the last part, basically we saw that Mia and Susanna were going to get into a palaver of sorts. They were going to start discussing kind of the things that are going to be involved with this whole arrangement between the two of them. Essentially what we learn is that not only is Susanna and Mia in this body, but Detta is here too. You start to see a lot of Detta come through because of the fact that when this whole thing is happening, it's basically in the mind of Susanna. And so literally everything comes into play when it comes to this palaver of sorts. So basically they get into a spot where both Mia and Susanna are able to see each other. And Susanna sees that Mia is a dark haired white woman. And we kind of got that description of her from the Wolves of the Kala, but this is the first time that Susanna is really recognizing Mia. She thinks that she looks really familiar, like she's seen her somewhere before, or at the very least, like have, there's been a lot of talk about who she is, but she's not really ever 100% sure what's going on. Mia basically then talks talks about how this chap, this baby that she is carrying, that Susanna is also carrying, is something that is very important. There are some very important people who are really wanting their hands on this child, and they have promised Mia that when birthing it, she will get to keep this baby. But unfortunately, Susanna starts thinking that this is kind of the bad people, and she tries to basically get Mia to understand that it's entirely possible that Mia's been played a fool, and that, you know, this baby, is, even though it might be super powerful, she's not going to keep it. She's not going to be able to take care of it like she thinks. Mia basically's main motivation is that she wants to have a baby. She wants to be a mother. And so when she agreed to do this, she did this under the assumption that she was going to be a mother and that she was going to take care of this baby for however long she was going to be able to. Five, seven years or so is what they kind of talk about. But she's like, this baby is important. It is going to bring Roland down. And Susanna asks Mia essentially about what happened to let her have this baby. And Mia, very early on, tells Susanna that the baby is actually Roland's. We already knew it wasn't Eddie's baby. We knew it as this demon entity's baby. But it turns out this baby's actually Roland's, and they explain why. So basically what happened is that at the very end of The Gunslinger, the very first book that we see Roland Deschain in, he meets with this oracle who essentially tells him the pattern of which things are going to go. She kind of tells him things that are going to be happening very vaguely, but enough to where she's able to 
give him the information he wants. And in payment of that information, he was to have sex with her. And essentially what happened is that he implanted her, his seed in her. And this demon had kept this seed for however long it may have been. So that when the demon entity we see in the wastelands that rapes Susanna, when they are trying to bring Jake into Midworld, that entity was the same entity as the Oracle. And so then that seed essentially makes its way into Susanna. The idea basically is that all of these demonic entities that are involved in this world are what are called hermaphrodites, which if you're, if you're not familiar with what a hermaphrodite is, a hermaphrodite is a person that basically has both the genitalia of a male and a female person. They are actually born this way. There are actual real life people that are like this, where they have the actual anatomy of both male and female humans. And so essentially these demons, the one in particular that rapes Susanna, is the same one that that Roland had sex with in the gunslinger. So essentially that seed then carried into Susanna, therefore making this baby technically Roland's, but it's also not at the same time. It's a very weird kind of thing. But in general, this baby is actually Roland's. And what Mia then also tells Susanna is that this baby is going to essentially be the thing that brings Roland down and is going to either kill him or at least distract him to the point where he is going to no longer be able to obtain the Dark Tower like he had originally wanted and has been going for for his entire life at this point. And Susanna basically quickly realizes not only is Mia absolutely batshit fucking crazy, but she's under the influence of some very dark and mysterious people, one of which being this man named Richard Sayer. Richard Sayer is some kind of a henchman to the Crimson King, and we learn that essentially... He is the one that is giving Mia this information, telling her where to go to have this baby. And this entire time that they're having this conversation, they're waiting for a phone call supposedly from this man. And by the time that Mia explains everything that she knows about what's going on, about this baby and everything, they get the call from Richard and he tells Mia where to go to basically have this baby and deliver it. And Susanna's trying to break through Mia, break through her herself basically in her mind and essentially you start hearing not only Susanna's voice but Detta's voice over the course of this fighting against you know this Sayer person and essentially we learn that Mia is incredibly strong she's able to hold Susanna and Detta off well enough to where she is forcing them all to go to this delivery area. Basically, I think it's some kind of either a hospital or it's a backdoor kind of surgery room, essentially, where she's going to deliver this baby and it's not spelling good things. Susanna also learned, though, that Mia has somehow sent off either through her own way or tipped somebody off to have people basically go dead and track down Roland and Eddie and kill them. And it's kind of in a way to keep them I, at least busier from being able to find Susanna and all these things, or at the very least, just get rid of them like as best they can, you know, whatever it is. And Susanna gets rightfully pissed because she's realizing that Mia has constructed this whole thing with the help of obviously the people that she's working for. And it's very likely that her husband and her friend will be killed in the attempt to try to save her. That's kind of where we end chapter six. And then we get into chapter seven, which is the seventh stanza called The Ambush. And the majority of this chapter is literally seeing that ambush happen to Roland and Eddie. They end up heading to Maine to go find Calvin Tower and Aaron Deepno, who we saw in The Wolves of the Kala. We understand that they are the people that hold the actual rights basically of the area that the Dark Tower is in and they are trying to get it from Calvin Tower to then in a sense protect it and what they find out is the people that are involved in the ambush are actually Balazar's people who Balazar we had met in the drawing of the three when we originally had met Eddie. This man was somebody that Eddie basically was running drugs for and he is a bad dude and we found out in the drawing of the three that they had killed Eddie's brother which caused Eddie to go completely completely ballistic and kill all of them. We also see them again in the Wolves of the Kala when we actually start interacting with Calvin Tower, where Eddie 
basically protects Calvin Tower from a couple of Balazar's cronies. And that took place at least 10 years before the events of what we saw in the drawing of the three. So there's some wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff going on that's like screwing everything up that we've already seen. And so essentially now these two people, specifically Jack Andalini, who is kind of like the head of the cronies in a sense, he recognizes Eddie from the last time that they saw him and still doesn't understand that this is the same kid he's go that's going to kill him basically in the drawing of the three but they go through this whole ambush and Roland and Eddie are able to protect themselves and fend for themselves and defeat this ambush of people and then they head out to where Calvin Tower and Aaron Deepno are and what they basically then also find out is a little bit more about Stephen King because in Wolves of the Kala there is a particular book that Calvin had sent over to Kala Bryn Sturgis with Eddie that was Salem's Lot by Stephen King which to us in our world we know that as Stephen King's second published book and we learn in Wolves of the Kala that the character of Father Donald Callahan is a character that links to Salem's Lot and the Dark Tower series because of the fact that he came from Salem's Lot and essentially over the course of several years found his his way into Midworld after being pushed out of a window and basically dying and coming to life in Midworld. And when they find this book at the very end of Wolves of the Kala, Callahan is perplexed because this book contains the entire story that he's already told Roland and his team about what happened in Salem's Lot with the vampires and all these things. And he's basically like, who wrote this? There was nobody that I know that wrote this down. These are my exact words, everything. So I don't understand. And he's kind of has this kind of crisis in a sense of whether or not he's a real person. We go to chapter eight, which is called A Game of Toss. Eddie and Roland basically start trying to figure out, you know, if the Stephen King person is real. And one of the characters, basically John, he tells like the fact that, you know, he knows who Stephen King is, he knows his wife, he knows that he's a real person, all these things, just kind of giving them information about something that they were really questioning because it seems like this story is a work of fiction. But to them, to Eddie and Roland, it's the life story of Father Callahan in a sense. And so they try to like figure out whether or not this is actually real. Then we get into chapter nine, which is called Eddie Bites His Tongue. Here they find obviously Calvin and Deepno. Specifically though, what happens is they find Deepno first and Deepno is very unaware of everything that's happened. He kind of was just along for the ride. He's Calvin's best friend and is a man that is much older than Calvin. I think he's at least in his 70s, whereas Calvin is more of like his 50s. And Deepno has no idea what is going on. He just knew that Calvin came to him and was like, we got a jet and you know, all these things. And then it turns out that Calvin has basically been outing himself in a sense where he's going out and he is purchasing rare copies of books because it is something he loves to do. He has a vast collection of, you know, super priceless books that are worth thousands of dollars. And it's something that he never stopped doing, even though he's supposed to be in hiding. He's supposed to be not in sight because he had Balazar's men after him who are looking to take the place that the Dark Tower is. The, basically, the property that the Dark Tower resides on is incredibly, like, valuable and Balazar's men have been after it for years which is why we see them in the Wolves of the Kala and this is where they kind of get into a bit of a argument with Calvin Tower because when Tower appears after having gone to find a particular book that somebody was going to sell to him not only is he freaking out because there's people that are here when no one's supposed to know they're here but Eddie and Roland are like you're a fucking idiot. Like, you've literally been outing yourself to people, and we literally have Jack Andalini and his cronies who we just fought back there for you. They're looking for you, and they know where you are. Like, you're in massive, massive shit. And Aaron, deep no, he ends up getting, like, really pissed too. Like, are you serious? Like, you've put us both in danger by going on your stupid adventures to find these rare and priceless books when you should have not done that, you dumb shit. Eddie reminds Calvin of the fact that he promised to sell Eddie the T Dark Tower's property for like a dollar with the promise of millions coming to him later before he sells it off to Balazar's men. And they basically decide to adhere to that promise and they draw up a contract about that whole thing. And that's pretty much 
everything we learn other than the fact that like it's very clear that in this world there's like things that are different than what even Eddie remembers of his world and it kind of causes like a bit of another crisis. He he constantly has existential crises because honestly like things that he thinks are in the real world aren't really the real world to him and so it's just kind of all kinds of craziness. But that's basically what happens in the, in the second set of 100 pages in this book and I really like this a lot. I feel like I'm more interested right now though in the story of Susanna and Mia obviously because this is about them and finding them and understanding what that whole thing is with the chap and the people that are behind that you know it, it makes sense that that's the more interesting part of this story but we also haven't seen at this point Jake and Father Callahan who are supposed to be basically finding Susanna and Mia. Like, we haven't seen their perspective at all since the beginning of the book. So I'm curious to know whether we're going to see them soon, because we're already now almost halfway through this, and I haven't seen them at all. I'm curious if we're even going to see them tracking Susanna down or, or not, because even looking a little bit ahead, the next chapter's looking like it's going back to Susanna and Mia, and... I just don't know. I have no idea whether or not we're going to see the two of them coming in and saving the day or if we're going to have to basically wait for Eddie and Roland to make their way to her. I don't know. But the next time I will come to you guys will be when I reach the page 300 mark, which will be when I get to page 301. Hey guys, so please excuse the weird white lighting. I have to use the flash eye on my phone because... If you guys know at all, filming at night here is like super dark because the light is super, super low. But I did reach page 300. While I speak on this, I will be drinking my wine in this very cool gothic vampire goblet that I got from Spirit Halloween over the weekend. Also, if you hear any like little tapping noises, that is of my rat who is sitting right here to the left of me drinking her water because she's very, very thirsty, but she's trying so hard to be so quiet. So last we left off, we had Roland and Eddie basically confronting Calvin Tower and signing over the lot that the tower is on in order to protect it. And basically, the rest of that chapter is pretty much just the continuation of the conversation between Calvin Tower, Eddie, and Roland, and Aaron Deepno, and pretty much getting the, the tower signed over. The ambush that had happened earlier, Eddie has sustained an injury, so part of the chapter does dictate Roland helping him take out a bullet that was lodged inside his shin. Learning a little bit more about the person, Stephen King and Salem's Lot, because obviously Calvin Tower is very well versed in various things about literature and specifically like really old copies of things, things that are like rare copies. And he talks about how the copy of Salem's Lot that he in particular has that is in Kala Bryn Sturgis currently that we talk about at the end of Wolves of the Kala is a very special one. Namely because it has very specific typos that are involved in it that make it a very rare printing. It's a very rare copy because of the fact that, like I said, with typos in it, it's something that is not really seen and is one of the only few copies that have it. Like, there's very specific typos within it that make it therefore super valuable. I mean, like, any book you can think of that has ever been created and published, if it has in any way some kind of difference to a typical mass market copy, it is therefore super valuable because maybe it has something like deleted scenes or it has, you know, a certain name that was misspelled by accident. Like, those for some reason are super valuable even though they're like mistakes, basically. So, he talks about a lot how his copy of Salem's Lot is like that, and then Eddie basically goes into this story of this thing about lemons, where basically these animals that every so often they would become suicidal. There's some kind of small animal in Switzerland, according to what his brother Henry had told him, and he says that every 10 years or so they get suicidal and throw themselves over cliffs. 
And he basically talks about how specifically in terms of looking at things like the stock markets and especially back then when Eddie was, you know, living in like the 1980s, how things like Microsoft were really getting big and everybody was pooling their money into things like Microsoft because they were thinking it was going to be something revolutionary. And Henry was very much against it because he didn't think the technology was going to really pick up as well as what everybody else had thought. And as we know now, Microsoft and Apple and various other tech companies have become very, very influential in the daily lives of pretty much the entirety of the world. And so it basically was him talking about how things can be like really, really volatile. And things like computers can all of a sudden just, you know, go through this whole lemon situation where they're just going to end up dying and, you know, essentially just go kaput randomly. And what this then leads Eddie to do is to tell Calvin Tower to start getting invested in the idea of Microsoft because at this current moment it's still 1977 so things about Microsoft haven't really picked up yet it's not until about 1982 that shares for Microsoft start getting really big and so he tells Calvin to get invested in it in 1982 so that by the time it's like 1985 or something like that, like a few years down that line, he will be making a ton of money off of it, which is where he's going to start seeing that millions of dollars come in from having sold the tower to Eddie and Roland and the rest of their quartet. Then we get into chapter 10, which is called Susanna Mio, Divided Girl of Mine. We go back to Susanna and Mia who are battling it out. They are trying to overtake the other throughout the entirety of this. And essentially they start heading toward this area. They're starting to even just try to get out of the hotel that they're currently staying at. But Mia is having a very hard time controlling the situation because there's a bunch of random people there that she doesn't know. They're asking her basically to take pictures of them and she is very unfamiliar with this because Mia is from Midworld, so she doesn't know anything about what pictures are, and she's becoming very protective of herself and of her body to the point where she has to get Susanna to lead them away from the hotel and get them on the path that they need to be. But through this, Susanna makes a deal with Mia that if she does this, Mia needs to give her some straightforward answers because even in the last point that we met with her where we had learned a lot about the fact that, you know, the baby that she's carrying is Roland's, there's still not a lot of information delved into about how exactly Mia is the one pregnant, but Susanna is not, even though they occupy the same body. Throughout all this too, Susanna is learning that Eddie has been actually trying to communicate with her. Before the end of the last chapter, Eddie had tried to communicate to Susanna saying, hey, try to stall Mia as best you can. Jake and Father Callahan are on their way. Do what you need to do to get her to stop moving so that they can try to find you. And so part of that is basically like playing through Susanna's head. So part of what she's trying to do through learning this information is also to distract Mia and basically stall her. So then what basically happens is when they actually end up getting to a point where they can sit and talk again, essentially what Mia ends up going through is telling her the story of how exactly Mia made the deal with Walter O'Dim, who is also Randall Flagg, who is the man in black, who could possibly be the Crimson King. She tells about how they made a deal with her to be essentially this mother figure, to have this baby, and essentially use this baby as a way to kill off Roland Deschain. Because apparently what happened was Mia originally was a demonic entity that had fallen in love with the idea of having a baby through watching people as she had her immortal life. And she fell in love with this young boy named Michael and she wanted to have her own child. And so understanding that this was something that he could use to his advantage, the man in black basically had come to her and was like, hey, uh, I know you want a kid, I think I can use you to help my own situation here and in the in return you can have a child but the thing is is you're gonna have to give up your immortality and essentially your demonic powers to be able to have this child and Susanna gets very confused about that because I mean to give up one's immortality to have a baby that you know it, it's there's a lot of negatives that come with that because I mean babies are not necessarily completely rainbows and sunshine that it's a lot of literal piss and shit you have to deal with because of the fact that a baby is not able to take care of itself up until the age of probably about five or six sometimes. They're not able to really communicate well with people so they cry and they scream and they 
shit and piss themselves because they have no actual functionality over their bodies at that time. And so Susanna is really confused at the fact that Mia would want that so much because it seems like it would be a lot of work for somebody who had never had any interaction with a child before. And so we learn a lot about exactly how Mia then, instead of having Mia become pregnant, because Susanna was the one that became pregnant and Mia had basically taken over her body, the fetus basically was faxed to Mia. And it's a very strange thing that I'm still not really 100% sure how the hell that works. But that's what happens. And Susanna actually starts to become very defensive of this child. She starts to become very defensive of the fact that, you know, she is the one that had the seed implanted in her from the demon that basically was also Mia in some weird capacity. We're not really sure what that's all about. But Mia is hell bent on having this child for herself. And Susanna is kind of starting to understand that this child is a part of her as much as she doesn't like the fact that for one, it's Roland's and two, that she is basically carrying a possible demon child. It's still her baby and she does feel in some way protective of it, mostly because of the kind of relationship she's built with it, similar to how Mia has built a relationship with this unborn child. So then they come out of this whole palaver situation that they've had that's similar to what they had earlier and basically they're trying to still again traverse the area that they need to to get to this place where Mia's supposed to go for the delivery of this baby and Susanna's basically proving to Mia again by the end of this chapter that Mia is going to need Susanna. Susanna is able to read things in this current world that Mia cannot. Mia's not very knowledgeable of how things work in this world. And so in order for Mia to really get where she wants, she has to put her trust in Susanna. And Susanna is basically doing this whole building of her trust thing because she wants Mia to kind of step away from this bad group that is influencing her. Then we go into chapter 11, which is called The Writer. Now this, I think so far, has got to be my favorite chapter because this is literally a point where Eddie and Roland meet Stephen King himself. Like Stephen King, the writer, writes his, himself as his own character into his own book. And it is so interesting because I have never heard of an author that has done this in their own story and actually pre presented themselves in a pretty neutral fashion as well as Stephen King has. He doesn't try to overplay who he is and in this character. He doesn't try to undersell himself either. He just makes himself the very run-of-the-mill kind of guy just like he is. And it's so fascinating. So what happens is Eddie and Roland, they start heading toward where Stephen King supposedly lives and they start talking about this idea of like, you know, it's entirely possible we might not be able to convince this guy that he's supposed to help us. And it's entirely possible this man is incredibly powerful, more so than he's ever going to really understand. How do we exactly get this whole thing to work? Is this going to be something that's going to actually help us with getting Susanna back? Is this something that is going to be like a massive turning point when it comes to, you know, searching for the tower. They also talk about how it's entirely likely they can give the contract that they have for the tower to Susanna's godfather, who is a lawyer that is very, very well established and is trustworthy, according to Susanna. So having him hold on to that asset can probably make it so that that asset grows in m a lot of money because of the fact that Susanna's original name, Holmes, the dentistry company that is made through her father's empire, basically, already has a lot of money and having this contract would kind of increase the wealth that that has. And so like that would bring in a lot of money to pay back to Calvin kind of thing. And Eddie just kind of starts again, becoming incredibly philosophical and, and existential. Eddie f throughout a lot of this, starting a little bit from the wastelands, really over the course of the of the last several books, 
has become more and more existential, more and more philosophical, very aware of how things are happening. Because from the very beginning of how his character was presented in the drawing of the three, you thought he was kind of just this stupid, drug addicted individual who was not really worth much, didn't view himself as worth much in the first place. And then you see, start to see in the wastelands that he starts to value himself more once he becomes a gunslinger. And then especially in Wolves of the Kala, you really start to see him become this warrior that he's meant to be. And I think that in this book in particular, it's very apparent that he is even aware of some of the consequences and he's actually thinking ahead a lot of times which is very unlike him he's not usually able to think ahead in these situations that they get themselves into but he's starting to do that and so eventually they do end up meeting Stephen King who is flabbergasted when he meets Roland because he literally says that Roland should not exist because the only way he exists is in his head and in the story that he had written that he had shelved away by this point. And so it is entirely existential in and of itself to see this happen because thinking of how Stephen King must have written this to really put himself outside of himself and get so involved in this story and think of how he would respond to meeting a character that literally came to life in front of him that he had cooked up in his mind that he didn't think anybody was going to you know really fit the description of wasn't going to be an actual person to think of how that must have been as a writer going through and creating this scene and and then having these interactions with them and trying to talk to him about, you know, the book itself and what was written about Roland, you know, it's just so fascinating to see this whole thing basically like come to life and they start really talking to him about several things and like things that he wrote about Roland with his history and all these things and it's just so funny. And at one point, Stephen's like, okay, I gotta take a break from this. I gotta go pick up my kid. Here, I will give you the manuscript that I have, that I know where it is. You can read this for yourself of what I've written. And I'm gonna expect that when I return, you're gonna be gone. And I can get on with my life and actually never ever think about the fact that I met you in real life ever again. And maybe this was just a fever dream. I don't know. But I think in a sense they do try to get Steven to like continue working on this because at this point in time he never finished the first book, The Gunslinger. So I think that this is kind of a, a point where we're going to have Roland and Eddie encouraging Steven to finish the story because they call him Tailspinner, something like that. And to me that indicates that Steven's character has immense power in terms of how the story ends with this whole thing, which makes total sense because obviously the writer Stephen King creating these books obviously has the ultimate power of how the story ends. But I think in this, in the context of the story itself, looking into the actual like plot of the story, Stephen can have massive impact in terms of how things go for Roland, Eddie, Susanna, Mia, Jake, Father Callahan, everybody, like even the Crimson King. So I think that they think that it's possible he can be a key to either leading them ultimately to entering the Dark Tower, or at the very least he can provide them with some kind of buffer, maybe, shield, if you will, of some kind in order to know how to enter, enter the Dark Tower and defeat the Crimson King, how exactly it is that they can, you know, take him out once and for all kind of thing. So... I don't know. This chapter, though, like I said, has been my favorite just for the pure fact of seeing Steven as his own character. This is something that is very abnormal. You don't really ever see any author write this kind of thing in their own stories because it would be seen as, you know, a little narcissistic. But there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose is, is that because the Dark Tower world is so vast and spans across all these different universes and worlds, it is literally the pinnacle of a multiverse story to the point where our actual world could be involved in this story and in a lot of ways actually is. And one of the things that Eddie talks about very philosophically is this idea that even in his world, the world he grew up in, it is not exactly 
what is the real world because what he starts to understand is that there is one particular world the one that he and roland are currently in to see stephen king that particular world is the world where there are no do-overs they have to do everything exactly right in order for things to go the way they want and because of that it causes things to be so much more dire when Eddie realizes that he is not in his exact world, but he is in actually a different world of New York than he is familiar with because of one very particular instance of conversation he hears, which is a little bit earlier in the story. He realizes that this particular world they are in with how Calvin Tower is and with Stephen King at the helm of this story, this is the place that if they're going to get something done, it's got to be done here and it's got to be done right. Otherwise, there might be some hell to pay because of it. So it's so fascinating to see how this entire story over the course of the series has kind of been building up to this idea of saving the universe, is saving the world, you know, defeating evil, all these things. But also at the core of it, this entire chapter so far has proven to me that this is also... It's a story about stories. It's a story about the story of good versus evil. It's a story about the story of all of these different people from all these different universes that come together to face a great evil that is threatening the livelihood of all the universes and worlds. And it's just so fascinating to see how everything seems to come together in this chapter. Everything we have seen has been kind of leading up to one of these moments. And this makes me even more excited to see how the final book, The Dark Tower, goes because if I feel any kind of hopefulness out of meeting Stephen King and the consequences of that and how that is going to spill over into the overall story of the ending of the gunslinger's life and Eddie and Susanna and their story and Jake, I am beyond hopeful for how things are going to go in The Dark Tower. It may involve a lot of deaths that I'm not prepared for, but this has honestly got to be one of my favorites so far because of that very particular scene and just kind of the exploration of the idea of creating the story by itself. I feel like this was the book where Stephen was really wanting to pay a lot of homage to the fact that he spent so much of his life building this story, not just for his readers, but for himself. How for decades of his life, he worked on this series and explored so much about himself and his writing and in between all the installments, working on all these other books and short stories and graphic novels and various things that all somehow had a tie back to this series. Like, truthfully, this is the book that really showcases the fact that this is the main series to end all series. It is the magnum opus of Stephen King and is one of the most fascinating worlds, one of the most fascinating science fiction, fantasy, horror, thriller mashups that you could ever ask for. And I think this book just really showcases a lot of the love that not only King has for this series, but it does showcase the amount of love that the readers have for it just from reading this myself and understanding and starting to piece everything together and understanding, I think, too, the mindset of, of these readers going into this for the first time and being excited for the new installments and, you know, excited to see what happens next. That just is such a testament to how timeless Stephen King's writing is and how insanely amazing his writing has become over the years and how this series has really stood the test of time in so many ways. What I will be doing is I will be finishing this book during the day tomorrow and I will let you guys know my final thoughts on this but it's looking like a high four star. I mean I, I will say that I feel like it not a lot has happened and I feel kind of lukewarm about most of the beginning of this up until that 11th chapter. So it's like a it's a possible four star, but I guess we'll see how the last few chapters wind up. Good morning, guys. So it is about 930 in the morning on Wednesday and I wanted to pop in because I realized that last night I forgot to talk with you guys about something specific that happened at the end of the last part. What I forgot to talk about was the fact that 
toward the end of that section, Roland basically hypnotizes Stephen and he basically gets Stephen to admit that he has been touched by the Crimson King since he was a child. And basically what's happened is that the King has pretty much been trying to keep Stephen from writing the story of Roland. Like, he reveals that essentially Cuthbert and Eddie are in a sense twins. They are the same person from two different times and two different like areas of the space you know and everything but they're otherwise like the same kinds of people which makes sense now it's very possible that Susanna and Elaine are kind of also the same thing or you know Elaine and Jake could be the same it, you know there there's a possibility that you know one of the other friends that Roland had growing up would be an, have another twin that is one of his companions currently so Stephen basically talks about how for years he tried to write the story of Roland and how he basically tabled it after finishing The Gunslinger because he didn't really see much of a point in it. He didn't like it after a while because for many writers you finish writing something or you start working on something and it's not, you don't think it's as good as like how you ho had hoped it would so you table it. And when he's in this hypnosis he reveals that it mostly was because he was afraid because he was being reached out by the Crimson King and there were many attempts on his life essentially through the Crimson King that kind of kept him from basically continuing the story but Roland and Eddie basically convinced Stephen through this hypnosis to continue working on the story and specifically to start when he hears the song of the turtle or the cry of the bear and that is when he will continue the story of basically what we know already going into this so the entirety of him meeting Eddie, Susanna, in the drawing of the three, bringing Jake back in the wastelands, talking about the story of Susan Delgado and Wizard and Glass, and the story of the wolves, the Kala, all of that, like everything. And it's going to basically be in spurts to kind of try to protect him, where he's going to, you know, finish one aspect of the story, and then be in a bit of a rest period and then pick it back up later so that's kind of the idea and then Roland and Eddie decide that they have to get out of Dodge and they have to basically go find Susanna because Stephen does kind of give a prophecy where in order for Susanna to be saved they're gonna have to basically break the 13th ball the wizard ball that Mia basically has and Susanna is likely to be killed, you know, in some capacity when the child is born. So they have to basically hightail it to wherever she is as quick as they can with Jake and Father Callahan, I guess, in some capacity still following them, which, again, we haven't even really seen Jake or Father Callahan at all except for the very beginning of this book so I don't know whether we're gonna see them or not but yeah so that was basically it and then like the very end of that chapter is Stephen waking up from the hypnosis and writing down a few lines and basically having this new lease on life and having this new inspiration which typically tends to happen with a lot of writers they have you know like a dream or something and something uh, is very you know clear in their minds and like they have this idea and they don't necessarily know all the inner workings of how something's going to work or how something's going to be written but they start getting like this inspiration and this idea of continuing this story when they have like the correct time to be able to work on it. Hey guys so it's just now after 4 30. I am working late today basically because later this week I'm going to be out for half of the day so I'm basically making up time for the time I'm going to miss on Friday but I have finished Song of Susanna and I ended up giving this four stars. I really like this a lot. I feel like though I don't know what it was but for the majority of the beginning of this I was kind of shocked with how fast it all went. I feel like this was something that was supposed to be not nearly as long as like Wolves of the Kala or Wizard in Glass by any means but the overall story was just fairly quick and there was so much that I wish we would have seen more of, things that we didn't get to see because of how the ending of the story was, and I don't know, it was just not exactly what I had thought it was going to be, but it was still very fun, very interesting to go through. So let's get to it. So we end off, like I talked about, the end of that chapter I was in, which was like the last couple pages of it was basically 
you know, like I said, Stephen King waking up from the hypnosis that he was under and starting the process of writing. So then we get into the twelfth stanza, which is Jake and Callahan. Basically what we see is in this entire chapter, it's Jake and Father Cal Callahan having to track down Mia and Susanna. And unfortunately, they come across this thing where basically a cab nearly runs over Father Callahan and Jake gets pissed and he's been pissed for a while. He has lost people that he cared about in the last book and this has kind of just been something that's been boiling under the surface for some time and so he basically sees this car crash happen and like I said, he nearly hits Father Callahan, and so Jake gets pissed and starts yelling, screaming, hitting things, punching the cars, nearly attacking some of the people, draws out his gun, and these people in New York are like, there's a 12-year-old kid here with a gun, what the hell's happening? And Father Callahan manages to smooth a lot of stuff over, and another man, another man of the of the faith basically comes up to them and starts talking about them and actually says that he saw the woman that they describe as Susanna slash Mia going in one particular direction but says that in particular they need to go back to the hotel that she was at because there's th something there for them. So they go back to the hotel and at the front desk the clerk says that there is a note for Jake there from Stephen King and this is basically what Stephen King had written that was at the end of the last chapter where basically it was a riddle saying like you know he had to find this key and that key is basically to lead them to the hotel room door and when they get into the hotel room they find the safe that has the black ball 13 and basically Jake and Father Callahan end up being almost compulsed by the energy of the ball to the point where Father Callahan nearly takes it for himself and tries to nearly tries to kill himself in a sense. So they end up breaking out of that and they end up basically going from there to try and find out where exactly Susanna and them are. So then we get into chapter 13 which is called Heil Mia Heil Mother and we go to Susanna and Mia who basically are kind of like on this operating table of sorts like she's in labor they're about to give birth to the baby and there's all of these different people surrounding them and some of them are vampires some of them are other like weird creatures there's not really a hundred percent certainty as to what's exactly going on but we basically in this last chapter see the entirety of Susanna giving birth to the chap and Mia giving birth to the chap basically and what also happens is Mia starts to realize that these people are going to probably kill her baby whether it's they're going to eat them or not they're basically going to keep her from actually taking care of this child like Susanna had been trying to tell her. She had been saying for a lot of this book that you know they're not going to let Mia take care of this baby. There is something much different involved. And so Mia makes a deal with Susanna that if Susanna can get them out of there, Mia will go with them and will listen to her and all these things. But it's proving kind of futile their involvement in trying to escape. They don't really have the ability to escape. And essentially, the baby's born. And that's pretty much where the book ends with the exception of what's called a coda which is called pages from a writer's journal and for the last almost 30 pages we read essentially what can be thought of as very much likely what Stephen King's writing process of the Dark Tower series up to this point was like with the exception that there's things added into it to make it seem like it's part of this story as opposed to being like a diary from you know, our time and when he was actually really writing the Dark Tower books. But essentially the way that like the description that's involved in like all these entries about going through and writing it and the times that he was struggling with his alcohol and drug addictions at the time from like the late 70s going into I think it's the late 80s. You know, there's a lot of talk in here about how that had a huge part in it and by the end of it what's really interesting is you see and after the very last entry he puts in which is in 1999 at the very very end it says that on June 20th 1999 that Stephen King 
died and that basically he was hit by a car. Some of the entries leading up to this have been talking about how people that were walking down the sidewalk were getting hit by random vehicles, people that, you know, weren't paying attention or were drunk or something like that. And there was a, at least one time that he had nearly been hit by a car. And so the book basically ends where we see the character Stephen King die, even though the real Stephen King is not dead. So that leads me to believe that this is very likely something that is going to play into the Dark Tower itself because whether or not his death is influential I think is going to still affect something that happens in the story of the Dark Tower because the whole thing was that Roland really wanted Stephen to continue writing the story because he was essentially being told or, you know, having things happen that made it seem like something didn't want him to finish the story. And by the time that he dies, the last couple of books haven't really come out as of yet. As it is, Song of Susanna was originally published in the early 2000s, I want to say, like maybe 2006? 2004. So by the time that this book came out, and in, in conjunction, the time frame of like when what book had come out by the time the character Stephen's death was happening, it would have been after I believe Wizard and Glass was published. And so basically what I'm wondering is, is that going to have any effect on the way the Dark Tower, the last book goes? Because it's just going to be interesting to see whether or not for one, Roland and Eddie end up going back in time at some point, or like they jump forward into a different time when, you know, as they do, where they see Stephen, you know, that before he dies, and if his death wasn't necessarily an accident by any means. In general, really liked it. Like I said, I feel that the biggest issue I had was it felt like it went by super fast, and I think that the majority of that was just those sections of Susanna and Mia were so long compared to the rest of the book that it felt like that Susanna and Mia's story for the first giant chunk of the book I you know wasn't necessarily sloughing through it but it was so long and then you get to parts like with Eddie and Roland and then especially with Jake and Father Callahan they just went by so quick and then we went right back to Susanna and Mia both times and it just felt like everything was boom 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 like there was no stopping and which is interesting because even with a 400 page book, sometimes these ones in particular can still take me some time. And I wonder too if it's kind of my perception of this series because I'm so used to reading, you know, Wizarding Glass, which was almost 900 pages, and then Wolves of the Kala, which was like 700, I think, something like that, 600 something. So I guess that my perception's a little wonky considering the fact that not only that, but then The Wastelands was also, I think, over 500 pages. This is just very strange for me. And I know that between Wizarding Glass and Wolves of the Kala, I did read The Wind of the Keyhole, which was only about 250 pages, but the wind through the keyhole felt way longer just because of the fact that the majority of it was following the character Tim and it just was it just felt like it was going on forever. So I don't know my perception of time with this book it has been very wonky and I don't know whether that's me or that's how other people felt with this book that it just kind of was very quick and it was almost kind of jarring in a sense. But I really like what was going on. I kind of wish that we would have seen a little more in terms of like the aftermath of the birth, but obviously that's going to be saved for the last book. So I kind of am curious as to what's going to happen, whether or not, for one, if Jake and Father Callahan are going to get there, because there was the mention that they thought that they were going to possibly die trying to save Susanna. So I'm a little scared because Jake has already died once in this series. And I'm not about to lose him again. I don't want Jake to die again, but... It's going to be what's going to be, and I have no say in the matter. Stephen King's already written and published the book, and it's been out for years, so I have really no say in what happens in the end. I really liked this one. Very impressed with, I think, the just the way that the story's gone, and I'm very excited to see 
the end of it, but it's kind of sad too that we're getting to the very last book in the Dark Tower. If you guys read Song of Susanna yourself and would like to share your thoughts with me, please let me know down in the comments below what you thought. I feel like for some reason, like I said, this just went by really fast and I'm a little shook up by it, honestly. So I'd love to hear what you guys had to say about it, but thank you guys so much for joining me in this video. If you guys did enjoy it, please do give it a big thumbs up. And if you haven't already and you'd like to be and would like to see more content like this, go ahead and hit that button down below and subscribe to become an owl at Narflock. And I will see all of you guys in my next video. Bye guys!